the Cressy class. And I'll explain why, but this episode is dedicated to a gentleman called Mike Coleman. So, the Cressy class. They're special ships. They're cool ships. They're mostly famous for how they died. Mostly famous for how they died. And that's a cruelty. Because it's a world you're living in which is very different than what people will think about when they imagine history backwards. When you read history, you know so much of the things that have happened since that it can often make it seem like people when they were in the time, earlier time, should have known what was coming. Should have been able to predict the future. I've been thinking about this video for the last four or five weeks, honestly. And some ideas kept going through my head from my ICTA level. Where I was taught three sayings, and I always sort of fudged the third one because it can change. It was a longer one, and therefore my brain sometimes plays a little trick on me, I think. First one was picnic. Problem in chair, not in computer. <laughs> it sums up most IT technicians' problems. Um, next one is garbage in, garbage out. It's a programming philosophy to live by. If the person is putting in garbage, then you will get garbage out. And occasionally, you might not get garbage out. Occasionally, they will put in such weird form of garbage that you will actually get something usable out. And that will be a learning experience in of itself, but that will be entirely unintentional and entirely nothing to do with what was probably the garbage was put in there for in the first place. And the last one is... Future-proofing only works for the things you can predict. See, a computer, when you're future-proofing a computer, and I'm, I've built one myself recently, I've put in an ex a big motherboard which has lots of expansion slots. I've put in a hard drive, an SSD drive, a hard drive, and a solid-state hard drive, and a regular hard drive. So I have lots of memory space, and I can expand on those. I can have multiple of each added in. I could fit in four SSDs and four hard drives if I wanted. It could fit a second graphics card in there if I really wanted to. If I really wanted to. It's got RAM, and I've only filled in half the slots. So I've put in a lot of future-proofing that I can easily upgrade it. Which is great. Honestly, the thing I think I'll need to do, if I need to do anything, is there going to be a RAM. It's the thing which is up there as my first thing to buy. But that's kind of easy. Because I know what kind of software I'm running. I know how intensive it gets. I can predict it over the next three to four years, which is the average life of a computer. Maybe I get with some expansions and some expansions and organizations, I can get it up to six to eight years, but it's not really a long-term thing. I'm not predicting something which is going to have to serve 20, 30 years. And I'm predicting something which is in a very confined environment because it's for me doing the things I know I need it to do. And even then, if the world radically changes and we're all suddenly doing entirely virtual reality and the future of, I don't know, YouTube becomes virtual reality classrooms where I have set up a classroom space and everyone can wander in, sit down, and then there's me in front of this virtual reality board talking away... In simple terms, it's all rather predictable. I can focus, and if the world does change randomly to be that whole virtual reality set network, I'd probably built need to build a whole new computer system. But again, that's a couple of grand. It's a lot of money for me, but compared to the cost of these ships, well, let's put it this way. 
in the 1890s, and when they are being completed, this is their figures put in 1904, they are estimated roughly £750,000. That's a lot more than a couple of grand even then, but that's a lot more, probably once turned into the equivalent of, you know, ratio of what a couple of grand is today is versus was would have been then, I'm fairly sure that 750 grand is going to be a massively larger amount. And when you're predicting for ships, you have to predict for not just your own needs, but what other people need. What other people do. And there's all sorts of randoms that can turn up. Anyway, I was thinking about all this, and I was thinking about that point, and I kept thinking about an old teacher I had from school. My IT teacher, Mike. And I was hoping I would see him at the next school get-together, because occasionally I do actually go to them. And he always was there, and he'd organised them for a while. Because I was going to say thank you to him. Because his skills, the skills he taught me, being with you know building my own computers, all these things, he sat me down when I was a GCSE student and said, Clark, you use a computer for everything, don't you? Yes. You've been doing that for how long? Since I was 11, sir. Alex, you're going to need to learn how to fix these things, to take them apart, troubleshoot problems, and put them back together. Because you're going to be dependent on them for the rest of your life. And if you don't know how to do it, you're going to be up a creek without a paddle more often than you want to think about. And that's what he did. And I went and did ITA level. I will say, he's one of my favourite teachers in school. Him, Mr. Holder Williams, Mrs. Jones, Mrs. Bickerford. I can remember some names. And I can remember the names of the great, really great teachers I had. And I'm really lucky to have had them. Mr. Holder Williams taught me history at secondary school. Mr. Young was my teacher at primary school. And I remember little bits from all of them. My favourite teacher was Mr. Sega, but um, he was the physics master and he had a huge handlebar moustache and was just one of the coolest people you will ever meet. I mean, really, he is a living legend in his own lifetime. But no, the more I was thinking about the Cressy class, and the more I've been thinking about the discussion, the more I was actually thinking about the lessons Mike taught me. The more I was thinking back to the things that were lessons about nothing to do with history, and nothing to do with ship design, but had such a massive impact on when you're thinking through these problems and these processes. When you're talking about future-proofing, when you're talking about they should have known, they should have known this, they should have known that. Well, how would they going to know? How would they know? It's easy to stand there and go, well, these ships should have been made proof against submarines. And honestly, considering some of them have refits as late as 1939, probably some modifications would have been sensible. But what modifications could you really make to them? You could bulge them, but that's going to make them slower, which will make them less useful. You could put subdivisions inside their hull, but that basically means you're going to have to rip everything out from inside their hull and rebuild the inside of their hull. At that point, it's cheaper to build a new ship. You could get rid of them and get new ships. But if you do that, you have to build new ships. And... Well, at the moment, the trouble is, in this period we're talking about, it's just becoming apparent that battle cruisers have moved far enough away from your Cressier cruiser fleet that you're going to need something in between. And that's the trouble. The Cressies were the last of the 19th century cruisers. This is Hogue launching. They're the last of the 19th century cruisers. They were what gave rise to the line of 20th century cruisers that goes through Drake... Which are fairly decent. Mom of... Oh. Someone had a bright idea about the idea of the first class protected cruiser. Devonshire's. They're getting better. Duke of Edinburgh's. Oh yeah. Warriors and Minotaurs. Let's be honest. Those last three classes. They are good ships. 
for the cruiser roll, they are good ships in World War One. But let's think about that. There are six classes built after this, and then they don't build any more armored cruisers or large cruisers before World War One. They're called when the Seventh Cruiser Squadron, the Live Bait Squadron, by some very interesting people. They're not Live Bait Squadron. They're a, they do some duties and they scare the Germans on a couple of occasions. They are more than capable of fighting destroyers and probably cruisers and putting up a significant level of resistance and causing significant damage. But the rise of the submarine that's happened and it's happened after they've come into a being and again if we're talking about pre from the launch of HMS Warrior to the launch uh, to the commencement of World War One you've got at least four ages you can make in terms of ship design I know we like to think of Dreadnought, pre-Dreadnought, Ironclad. But let's be honest. Do you want to go up against a ship with Krupp armor when you've got Harvey armor? Do you want to go up against a turbine-powered ship when you're a triple expansion-powered ship? There is the single-cylinder triple, a single-cylinder engine, twin-cylinder, triple engine, four-cylinder triple expansion. All these things are systems which come in in time. There are the evolutions of the propellers. There is the going from sail powered primarily to engine powered primarily to no sails at all fitted. There is the change in guns, there is the speeding rate of fire, there is the change in ammunition, shell type, all these things. There is the change in the ability to aim and target weapons. There are so many changes in less than 60 years. We, today, we live in a period of pretty much stability in ship design. The freakiest thing we've seen is that they've gone from being things which ignored the concept of radar stealthiness to being... Slab-sided things which look like someone's turned an F-117 grey. Life happens. Luckily enough, I have found some pretty decent sources. And this one, I've actually put ended up putting in here. Rather than just putting in a link below, which hopefully I'll remember to put in the description. I also wanted to put it in here, because it had all of White's notes and summaries produced as appendices, which was really, really useful as I couldn't track down my own copy of them I had from years ago. So the genesis of a cruiser navy, British First Class Cruiser Development, 1884-1909, by Scott M. Lingren, University of Salford, PhD thesis, submitted 2013, uh, pages uh, 330 to 338. Please note those page numbers are the page numbers on the bottom of pages, not the page numbers according there. As always, there is a difference between these numbers and those numbers. So I'm using these numbers because these are on the pages. And if you print it out, you'll still be able to find them. So the Cressies are the last of the 19th century cruisers. But they're also the starting point of the 20th century cruisers. They sit at that midpoint. And it's, it's a cool point to sit at, but it's a problematic point. Because at one point, from one perspective, they can look like modern capable ships. <gasps> they must be viable. From a very real perspective though, these ships are not up to the task of what you need them to do. They're not going to be. They can't, possibly. There's no chance of them being up to that task. Which is sad. 
and upsetting, but it's the case. They're not going to be. Why would they be? They were conceived in, well, let's be honest, they're laid down in 1898. Designs have probably started being sketched in 1897. The mind and mental sort of working out of them is probably going back as far as 1894, if not 1893. In that the way White works, especially, he comes with a concept, he goes and does investigations, he wanders around the world, he thinks things through, and then he starts drawing them. William White is a wonderful art designer, and very much ahead of his time, but he's also, and I say this in the nicest possible way, he's not exactly the quickest worker when it comes to percolating through ideas, and he'll often be thinking about the next generation and the next next generation while he's building this generation, and lo and behold, this generation will not include the ideas from the next, ne next generation or next next generation. Because he's still working those ideas out in his head. He's methodical. I have one uh, absolute respect for him, and I understand the scenario. If you, if you consider when he's building ships, he, being methodical is sensible. If you consider the number of ideas which percolate out and the ships which are built to them and then look absolutely terrible and like they're about to collapse any second, you can really understand why he is as methodical as he is. But it's also true that we are talking today about a squadron of which 50% was sunk in one day in September 1914. By one boat. One submarine. And that is their claim to fame. That is what people think about when they think about these ships, and they are so much more. And for that we have to go back to the beginning. But also, I will say this. On the light and subject of the 22nd of September 1914, I'm going to deal with that after I've discussed all the ships. I'm going to deal with that and the events that day separately. Because I think they deserve that. So, I'm going to expand this out a bit so it makes it slightly easier to be read. Oh. Cressy's, according to Sir William H. White, their designer. Fundamental ideas on which the design is based are as follows. Special adaptation for service with the Channel and Mediterranean fleets, and the performance of all duties hitherto devolving on first-class cruisers attached to the fleets. Capacity for close action as adjuncts to battleships. Suitability for employment on detached services, if required to be used for the protection of shipping, commerce, and communications. Armament, protection, speed, and coal endurance to be such that the new cruisers should be formidable rivals to the best cruisers built or about uh, or bu built or building for foreign navies. And then the range. To realise 21.5 knots, new cruisers were required 21,000 indicated horsepower, as against 18,000 indicated horsepower for the 20 and a three quarter knots in the latest vessel, the Diadem class, which he's constantly making comparisons to. New cruisers will therefore closely approach the sea speed provided for the designs of powerful and terrible, and will certainly equal or surpass other cruisers. The naval members were of the opinion that new cruisers should correspond closely in coal endurance with the latest battleships. It would appear that at cruising speeds of 10 knots, this condition will be realised that the vessels carry about 1,600 tonnes of coal, or as against 1,800 tonnes in Majestic class and 1,600 tonnes in Canopus class. Bunker capacity can be found for 1,600 to 1,700 tonnes of coal. At the normal draft and Navy list displacement, 800 tonnes will be carried. This agrees with Canopus class. With the increased engine power demanded by higher speed and the extension of engine and boiler spaces, as well as the adaptation or adoption of the armoured citadel for hull protection, larger bunker space cannot be secured in a vessel of the proposed dimensions. Starting bunkers full, the new cruiser should be able to be capable of steaming for 30 days at a speed of 10 knots. At the highest sustained speed of 19 and 3 quarters knots, please note the difference between that and 21 and a half knots. Yes, the highest sustained speed versus the speed they can pulse to for a bit is 
often different in this period. They get closer as the technology moves forward and the ship design gets better, but still, there is a difference, and it's worthwhile remembering that when looking at the ships. And often, the British can ma maintain a higher sustained speed than others because of the quality of the coal they're using, the Welsh coal especially. The vessels should be capable of steaming for up to about 120 hours and covering 2,400 knots before their coal is exhausted. Uh, the mug capacity in Diadem class is for about 2,000 tons, more space being available. These vessels are specially designed for that service and a larger coal supply is valuable. Now, let's think about that. 2,400 knots. Two thousand four hundred knots. Well, that's an interesting thing. Two thousand four hundred. That's 2,400 nautical miles. If we convert that to miles, well, it's about 2,600. That's a long way at high speed. But it's uh, where I will quickly answer the first question that's bound to come up and comes up quite regularly when I start talking about these ships. Where would they have been better used? And usually then people start to go, well, we could have had them at Coronel. No. The only thing slowed on them at Coronel would have been at Toronto. The only advantage to having a, uh, having a couple of Cressies at a Trent, uh, or two or three Cressies at, uh, uh, at um, Coronel is that would have been some well six more 9.2 inch guns probably just as bad in terms of their six inch guns actually being able to fire in the rough seas bottom group definitely bottom level definitely not maybe the higher casements maybe able to fire something it gives you mass but at a certain point if you're packing that many cruisers that many armoured cruisers into your force there, then Spay's probably going to turn around and run away anyway. And at which point he's going to have the speed advantage. 12,000 tonnes normal. Oh, and please note on the coal. Theoretically, 1,700 tonnes is their maximum. However... There are some very interesting accounts of some little journeys they did, which they seem to have managed to maintain their nottage for longer than they should have on that capacity of coal. Now, there are probably some good reasons for this. One, if you have very good quality coal, life can go better for you. Two, and this is an important one, some captains can be very creative in spaces they can find to store coal when they need to be. Or, alternatively, they can look at their chief and go, Chief? Yes, Captain? Solve this problem. Thank you, Captain. Carry on, Chief. There is sometimes a perception that this sort of relationship is a new thing. That it didn't exist in the Age of Sail or other periods. It's always been around. There have always been NCOs who have been problem solvers. And a good captain has always made sure they've got them. Bad captains I can't speak for. But good captains, the ones who seem to do well and get higher, go higher up, there seems to be certain NCOs who appear in their commands... It's kind of like they have, include them in their following, like some junior officers who sort of percolate along and seem to wander between certain officers from their postings and have, you know, all this encouragement to get ahead. There are NCOs which are like that as well, and they do well.
30 Belleville boilers, two triple expansion engines to drive two shafts with 21,000 indicator horsepower for a top speed of 21 knots. Complement, 725 to 760. Armand, two single 9.2 inch, that's 234mm guns, 12 single 6 inch, 152mm guns, 12 single 12 pounder, 3 inch 76mm guns, three single 3 pounder, 47mm guns, two 18 inch tubes, that's 450mm uh, torpedo tubes, in a torpedo room which is placed forward, submerged forward. Armour, well that's a 2 to 6 inch belt. Decks, 1 to 3 inches, barbettes, 6 inches, turrets, 6 inches, conning tower, 12 inches, bulkheads, 5 inches. Hmm. That's an armoured ship. Let's go back and look at this one again. Capacity for close action as adjuncts to battleships. Now, we know the Italians are building their cruisers to an extent to fill in for battleships. Japanese to an extent the same. The Italians, because they can't, they're not building battleships. The Japanese, because they don't think they'll have enough battleships. But the British have tons of battleships. What are they thinking about in terms of adjuncts to battleships? Well, it's two things. One, it's a realisation that others might bring cruisers to play in a fight, and if that's going to give them a numerical superiority and your cruisers can't get involved in the fight, then your battleships might find themselves in trouble, because numbers can count, especially with the rate of fire of guns you were talking about, and they get the lucky shot. That could be problematic. So having the numbers helps. But also, the British looking and going, hmm, that's not necessarily a bad idea, because it can work twofold. Because you could have your battleships, and the British could have their battleships, and you could send them in for a fight, and if you don't have your cruisers there, or cruisers that can help in a fight, and it's, let's say, a nice even fight, you've got six battleships, the British have bought eight. Oh, didn't we mention we've also got eight cruisers with us? Suddenly they've got a fighting line which is 16 versus your six. Maybe they do it even worse. Maybe they double envelop you. Two lines each of four, ca four battleships and four cruisers. Four battleships at the front, the four cruisers coming up the rear on each line and they go either side of you blasting you so your ships being engaged from both sides at once and it can only focus its guns one way add in some torpedoes being fired at you in the mix starts to sound pretty One of the interesting things about the British is they do not understand the concept in this period of proportional force. It's a modern terminology and it's something which has really come about really towards the end of the Cold War and in modern times. The idea of proportional force. We respond in a proportional manner. You do something nasty, we do the military equivalent of giving you a slap on the wrists you factor in probably what the proportional response is going to be. The trouble is that this proportional response can look... Well, it can look bad to domestic politics. It will also tend to rack up a body count, and that's something you don't necessarily want to do if you're making that decision. And it's difficult to justify the risk that it entails. So a proportional response is what you're left with. Take out an airfield. Take out a communications node. Take out an intelligence center. It's 
sink a couple of their ships in harbour. That's a proportional response. In the 19th century, the proportional response was, well, your squadron will be doubled enveloped and will be whacked from either side until it's no longer afloat. And after that, we'll turn up and blockade your main harbour. And, oh, by the way, occasionally lob some shells in if you really annoy us. It's a fairly brutal period. It's one of the things that's often forgotten when we look back in the past, and especially when... How do I put this? People imagine they would have been better, they would have been different, they would have had listened to the greater angels on their shoulders where others don't in that time period? No. If you're in the majority today, the odds are you'd have been in the majority back then. There are always people who are outside, who are outsiders and on the extremes and peripheries who sometimes they're right about the future but there's also a lot of them who are wrong about the future, let's be honest. It's one of the interesting things, again, the amount of people go back and look and say, oh, I would have been part of this group. This particular group who were right. There's just as much chance you might have been part of that group, or that group, or that group, or any of the two dozen groups which were completely wrong and horrific. Because they're all just as popular as each other at the time. Well, again, the difference in ship design. The proportional versus disproportional response. 19th century, it's all disproportional. Because the point is, you go whack. Not you go, don't do that again. You go, boom. You can't do that again now, can you? As you can see, you have a little bit of a ram bow. Although they don't seem to think about ramming much with the crazies. I still wouldn't like to be in a submarine which was hit by one. <sighs> they have some nice accommodations aft for admirals. And they have lots and lots of guns designed to provide a very good field of fire on the broadsides. <laughs> Let's be honest, forward firing, you've got four six-inch guns... Uh, a couple of 12 pounders and a 9.2 inch and after you've pretty much got the same maybe a couple more 12 pounders it's your broadside which is your strength but all those 6 inch guns 4 out of your 6 6 inch guns for each broadside are at level at which they can get blocked in heavy seas. Basically, any gun you've got which is below the cut down deck of the aft is subject to good weather. Again, this is a class designed to fight in the Mediterranean the channel. The channel can get rough, but when it does get rough, not much is going on. It doesn't get as rough as the North Sea. And certainly not as rough as the South Atlantic, or the or the South Pacific, and definitely not as rough as the very very cold waters we have to our north and our south on this earth. But this is their party piece. It's a nine point two inch gun. It's what gives them something which makes them credible in that fight. If they are assisting battleships. Yes, the 6-inch gun will do the most of the work. The 6-inch gun will do the vast majority of the work. It will do. It's the 6-inch Mark Eight naval uh, Mark 7 naval gun, sorry. And, well, built by Vickers. About 900 of the things were actually built. They'd still be fighting in World War II aboard insect-class gunboats, I think. They fired a hundred pound, that's 45 kilogram shell as standard. 
and had a range of, well, 14,000, well, 14,000, 15,000 yards, depending on the charge. And that's the 6-inch guns. Guess what? The 9.2-inch uh, Mark 9, or rather Mark 10 gun, as is fitted on the Cressy class, and of course the Drake class, and the Duke of Edinburgh class, and the Warrior class, and the King Edward class battleships, and the M15 class monitors, is slightly more powerful, but then you look at it and think, well, okay. Its maximum fire range is 29,000 roughly yards. It's going to fire a 380 pound, 170 kilogram shell. Think about the difference of that. The 6 inch shell the firing is 45 kilograms, 100 pounds. The 9.2 inch shell, 380 pounds. That's nearly four times the weight, or 100, uh, nearly, four, uh, nearly four times the weight of the 6 inch shell. It's going to have a much slower rate of fire, but when it hits, it's going to hit you hard. It will hit you very, very hard. And here are the ships, as we can see. Three are highlighted in black. Those are the ones torpedoed on the 22nd of September, 1914. Cressy, Avica, and Hogue. Gendo. This is the point at which I'm going to start sounding biased, but please note I'm going to explain why I do. The British ships are built by three different builders, and their engines are all supplied by different makers. Okay, now this is the normal point where I start going, and in France, this produces this, this, this. But there's a difference here. In France, they have to they use different boilers. In here, they're all using the same type of boiler. Because if they don't, the DNC will have words with them which will make them wish they were back home hiding underneath a table. Their engines are all rated to the same. They have a minimum indicated power rate, horsepower ratio. If they don't achieve it, then the DNC will do something nasty to their innards, which will probably make them become their outards. And finally, and this is the most important part, if you muck around with the DNC's internal design and plan of this ship, to an extent that it is different on inside than, it, than the other ships in the class are, the DNC will do something so nasty to you that your own great-great-grandparents who never met you will feel worried for you and what happened to you. Okay? That all sounds mildly aggressive and I hope YouTube understand, doesn't consider this me threatening them. This is what the Director of Naval Construction in Britain explained. And there is this difference here. In France, they are pushing to try and evolve. They have all these different debates going on. But also they have the fact that the army always does kind of take priority because they have these huge land borders and threats on them. And so they worry about those things. Understandably. But the navy in Britain is the big thing. And in Britain, the first sea lord is powerful. The first lord of the admiralty is powerful. Those two uh, people. When it comes to construction, though, if the DNC doesn't sign off on your ship, and the third Sea Lord does not sign off on your ship, and a third person, the chief engineer of the Navy, which is a very, which is the senior engineer in the Navy, especially while the, they're sort of separate during the pre-reform era, free Fisher reforms. And even to this day, the chief engineer is born. If those three people do not sign off on the ship, you will not get paid. You will not get paid anything until those three sign off on your ship. And you will not get another contract for another warship until those three sign off on your warship. And if you try and muck them around, then they will build everything in naval yards where they own everything. 
and they will just forget to award a, a contract to a civilian yard that year. And it wouldn't be the first time they've done it to make an example out of everyone. It's a good way of mucking around with the finances of all these companies. Because they're all to an extent dependent upon the Navy making a big order. They're investing in technology and all these things. And development for it. And if the Navy goes, turns around and goes, Nah, this year we're building our own. What? Yeah, we don't need to buy anything off any of you. Uh, uh, it makes the point. Any one of those three turned out and refused to sign off on that ship. Mm. So you build them to a standardized pattern. You build them to that pattern. Or you will have a very, very, very expensive build in your hands. Because the Navy, again, this never quite got this far, but... There are certain discussions, uh, especially the people who John Brown ended up taking over from, that um, the Navy might have turned around to them and said, we're going to take this contract off you, and you're going to pay the bill for us to re uh, redo the ship. And you might go, well, that's not in contract law in the 19th century. No, it's not. But there again, it's the Royal Navy in the 19th century, and it's the British government in the 19th century, and Britain has never had a codified constitution. We do have, though, a lot of interesting laws. And I'm fairly sure a sufficiently motivated and navel-inclined member of the law... Uh, member of the, uh... Well, law lords, the High Court, would have been motivated to rule the Navy's favour if necessary, if it had really ever come to that. HMS Cressy. She's a good-looking ship, isn't she? They're all good-looking ships. Now, she... She is, of course, named for the Battle of Cressy. And, please note, four of them are named for battles. Two for Greek gods. Not sure what happened. About They got two-thirds of the way through and they suddenly got all... Thespian and effect. Please note, I am joking. My family has history of naming our family member, uh, our family members, Alexander, Arthur. You know, Alexander the Great. Yes, my family's obsessed with a bit of history. Arthur, as in King Arthur, comes up quite a lot. There is a Donald, and there is a Douglas as well. Those are the names which go down my family branches. I can make the jokes about people making weird choices for names. And when you're in the middle of naming things after battles, a class after battles, suddenly going, oh, but that's so crass, let's go and name it after this sort of Greek god or this sort of thing. It, yeah, it looks like you're trying to, I don't know, do something. She was built by Fairfield Shipbuilding at their yard in Govan, Scotland. She was launched 1899. She finished her sea trials and went into Fleet Reserve in May 1901. She's then commissioned for service on the China Station in the 28th of May 1901. However, just after she went out, her steering gear broke down. And so she had to return, and so she didn't actually leave for the China Station. May, June, July, August, September, October. She arrived at Colombo on the 7th of November, Singapore on the 16th of November, and stays out there for a full tour. Then returns, and then gets assigned to the North American and West Indies station from 1907 through to 1909. So she does the full colonial policing. 
1909, she's placed in reserve. She's not drawn out of reserve till August 1914, when she's part of the 7th Cruiser Squadron. Again, we've got to put this into mind. People call the 7th Cruiser, Cruiser Squadron Live Bait Squadron. This is a ship which is launched in 1899. It's less than 15 years old. It has done four, five years on commission and the rest of the time in reserve. This is not a worn out ship. During the Battle of Heligan Blight, her and the ships of Cruiser Force C saw no action, but were critical actually in supporting the forces at Heligan Blight. And their coming along was one of the reasons why the Germans decided to withdraw when they did. Cressy actually managed to bring back 165 of the unwounded German survivors from the ships of um, Her Turret's Harwich Force. And she took them back to the North, escorted, escorted by Bacante. Afterwards. It was an interesting battle. Helgen Blight, that's 20th of August. And it's less than a month later that, of course, she and two of her sisters are gone. And as I said, I'll be discussing that in a bit. Sutlej. Now, okay, she's named for a couple of battles in the first Anglo Sikh War, which mm, was fought between the Sikh Empire and the British East India Company between 1845 and 1846 around the Ferozapur district of Punjab. That's a long time ago, but it was actually a very hard-fought war, and I'd say it's one of those interesting wars where both sides actually have quite a lot of respect for each other, and both sides can actually win it, but mainly that's probably because it's the East Indian Company, not the British Army, and they do take a lot of troops. Anyway, she's laid down... Of course, not at John Brown Company. She's laid down at their predecessors. Then John Brown and John Brown and Company um, take him over because, well, that's what a armor and heavy engineering and railway manufacturer does. They take over a shipyard and engine company because basically it looks like it's getting itself into trouble. She's commissioned in Chatham on the 6th of May 1902 by Captain Paul Bush. And her job is to take the place of HMS Diadem in the Channel Squadron. Now, she joined the squadron in July after steam trials. She then took part in the fleet review at Spithead on the 16th of August 1902. Again, we haven't heard this a lot before. For the coronation of King Edward VII. Amazing how many ships were there for that. Then went to visit the Aegean, taking other ships of the Channel Squadron with her, and to practice combined manoeuvres with the Mediterranean Fleet the following month. Now, in October 1902, she escorts HMS Hood from Gibraltar to Chatham. Hood had already been escorted on her previous leg of her journey by another crazy class. And it's kind of interesting that already in their career the Cressys were being used as adjuncts to the battleships. In this case, escorting them when they were damaged. Making sure they got home. It's far cheaper and easier than sending another battleship, but it means that your weakened ship has protection. Which can both help her if it's Mother Nature which is trying to take her, take her apart and also help her if something less natural wants to take her apart. She's then assigned to the China Station, remains there until May 1906, then she becomes the boys training ship in North America West Indies Station. She, you know, it's a very good station to send them to because, let's put it this way, whilst there are three strands in American politics, the strand which blamed Britain for everything that's gone wrong in the world, the strand which ignores Britain, and the strand which loves Britain. Usually the rule, the, the debate is between those two, if there is a debate going on, and this one just turns up every now and again just randomly. 
But the point is, the only real threat of war is when you have this strand in power in America combined with a strand of power in Britain which is so bellicose and insane that they actually will react to it. Um, so that makes the North America West Indies Station a great station to send the boys' training ship to training the young sailors. You'll let, they're going to have a real station experience with a real enemy to think about but at the same time, the actual likelihood of them finding themselves in a fight is very low. She became a uh, return home, as I said in 99, became flagship of the Reserve Third Fleet until 1910. And then, whilst off maneuvers off Bearhaven in 1910, she had a boiler ex explosion that killed four men, sadly enough. She was assigned to Ninth Cruiser Squadron, not 7th doing convoy escort duties off the French and Iberian coast. She was then transferred to 11th Cruiser Squadron in Ireland in February 1915 for similar duties. She joins the 9th Cruiser Squadron in September 1916 after working from the Ulster Azores uh, from February 1916. She's paid off at Devonport in May 1917, becoming an accommodation ship. In 1918, she became a depot ship at Rossife and is renamed to Crescent. She reverts to Sutledge in 1919 before being sold off in May 1921. She's a good ship and does a good career. A useful vessel. Abaca. And of course, named for the Battle of Abaca Bay. A.K. The Battle of the Nile. Now, she was laid down by Fairfield Shipbuilding Engineering at, in Govan, Scotland in 1898, launched 1900, and in 1901, March, she arrives at Portsmouth Dockyard for fitting out. She completed and commissioned in April 1902 by Captain Charles John Gravel Saul. She assigned to her train fleet upon commissioning and arrives at Malta later a month. She made two deployments from training, 1902 to 1905 and 1907 to 1912. In September 1902, she was sent to Greek waters for combined manoeuvres. These manoeuvres including landing of personnel at Napoli and Orgostelli, and pointing out to the Russians, exactly, uh, Russians and the Ottomans exactly how interested the British were in the survival of the Greek state and how supportive they were prepared to be. It's just an exercise. Why are you getting so hung up? They're just sailors being landed there. They're just sailors. It's just an exercise. It's just a cruiser. I don't know why you're reading more into it than we are, than uh, than uh, than there is. It's just a combined exercise of ships from the Mediterranean and the Channel divisions, and they're just doing just landing some sailors. It's just. It's just an exercise. Calm down, Ambassador. It's no problem. Nah, no, seriously. She then escorted Hood from Malta to Gibraltar. So, Abaca escorts Hood from Malta to Gibraltar and Sutledge escorts Hood from Gibraltar to Chatham. Interesting choice they chose, or what they chose. She was assigned to 7th Cruiser Squadron shortly after the outbreak of First World War and she was part of the force therefore that's patrolling the broad 14's North Sea to support the Harwich Force. Basically, they're there to provide the Harwich Force with backup. Should there come out more force from the Germans than the Harwich Force can deal with, or, not, or to try and buy them enough time for more ships to come down from the Grand Fleet if the Germans really make a run for it. This is a force which is supposed to be supported by destroyers, which is supposed to be a combined force. It is not supposed to just be these cruisers, okay? She again saw no action in the Battle of Heligoland Light 
It was rather sad for her. But she was there, she was off the Dutch coast and waiting to be called in. Hogue. Now, as said earlier, the picture I chose of the launching ship in the 19th century cruiser was Hogue. Named for the Battle La Hogue. Mm, always a fun one to be named for. Which, of course, took, part in an, uh, took place in a Nine Years' War. She was laid down by Vickers Sons, uh, Vickers Sons and Maxim at their Baron Furner shipyard in 1898. Launched 1900. Arrived at Plymouth for fitting out in September 1901 and commenced the sea trials in December 1901. In autumn 1902, she was considered complete and commissioned at Devonport. Finally, on the November 1902, she was then assigned to the Channel Squadron. In March 1904, she collided with the SS Maruf off Europa Point, which wasn't good for Maruf, and then she's transferred to the China Station after refit. Hmm... Life isn't too bad. In 1906, Hogue became the boys' training ship for 4th Cruiser Squadron on the North America's and West Indies Station. Oh, good lord. It's amazing. So that's where you send in the boys' training ship. North America, West Indies Station. And it's a crazy class. It's so unexpected. It's just... I never heard that before, have you? In 1908, she's put into reserve and then assigned to the Third Fleet at Nor in 1909. In November 1909, a coal bunker explosion kills two crewmen aboard her. She then receives a lengthy refit between 1912 and 1913, and of course is assigned a 7th Cruiser Squadron after the outbreak of war in August 1914. Now, after the Battle of Heligan Blight, Hogue. It's the ship which takes Arafusa, Commodore Tirrett's flagship, in tow and takes her back to port, the, to port after the battle's over. Basically, 7th Cruiser Squadron ride into the rescue of the Harwich Force. And by the time they arrive, the Germans have gone back and the battle's over. But they've ridden in, they've come in. And the Germans, knowing the British have more support coming out there, that's one of the reasons why they would draw. And they, the support is the 7th Cruiser Squadron. And that's one of the interesting things I think about history, because if they had arrived at the Battle of Heligan Blight at the end, if they got there before it was over, they'd probably taken part. They might have managed to score some victories, because the Germans were already in a weakened state, and with these ships arriving, they could... And then we might be remembering them completely differently than we're remembering them now. Because it'd be a case of, yes, they lost three, but they sank these ships in the Battle of Heligan Blight. So it'd be a case of, in the battle they were designed for, they did well. In the battle they weren't designed for, because it was an unknown thing they were trying to future-proof them against, they weren't. Because if you ask someone in 1897, are you designing your ships to deal with torpedo attacks from submarines, they'd probably look at you and go... We have, what, a handful in the world? Possibly. But, you know, it was likely. The more likely thing that they're designed for is deal with torpedo attack from destroyers. And they're supposed to deal with that by using their fast guns to take out the destroyers before they can... Well, not destroyers, torpedo boats. To take them out before they can actually fire their torpedoes. That's why they have all the 12 pounders they do. So designed to deal with torpedo attack, just not the one they end up having to deal with. Bacante. Ay, caramba. Named after the Greek god Bacchus. It was, of course, the god of grape harvesting, winemaking, orchards, fruit, vegetation, fertility, insanity, ritual madness, religious ecstasy, festivity, and theatre. I'm trying to put that together with being a naval cruiser. Um, God of grape harvest. I, I can't see many cruisers doing that. Wine making. If it was wine drinking. Orchards and fruit. A 
again? Have you tried to get a naval crew, even a modern crew, to eat their vegetables lately? Vegetation, again. Trying to get them to eat their vegetables. Fertility? Meh. Yeah. Insanity? Well, they've joined. They volunteered to join the navy, which means months away from home, out on a ship, trapped with uh, trapped with a couple of hundred people. Um, yeah, you could make a case. Ritual madness. Uh, religious ecstasy. Festivity. Hmm. And theatre. Oh god, shit plays. <sighs> yeah. No, they're they're just no. Okay, just no. Another one laid down at John Brown. Uh, upon completion, she was commissioned by Captain Frederick Edward Errington Brock, that's what's good name, twenty fifth November nineteen oh two, and assigned to Mediterranean Fleet as flagship of the cruiser squadron. Replacing HMS Andromeda, which was already out there. Andromeda, of course, is a Diadem class protected cruiser. She arrives in the Mediterranean and Brock changes places with Captain Christopher Craddock, who had been in command of the Andromeda. So they basically. Brock's crew. They get out there. Brock's got the crew trained up. Brock then swaps ships with Craddock. Craddock gets Bacante. And Brock gets Andromeda. Brock takes Andromeda home. And Bacante remains in the Mediterranean under Craddock's command until 1905 when she returned home and was placed in reserve. Craddock is the flag captain. He doesn't he doesn't go home unless the Admiral no longer wants him or unless he's getting promoted. That's the rule. If you're a flag captain, you're staying with your Admiral. They get to pick you. Is their right. Now, this is usually another point where people go, well, you know, what happens if these ships have been, you know, why weren't these ships, why were these ships doing what they were doing, and why weren't they, you know, going up to, or going down the Carnal, or doing all these things? Again, it's because they're not fast enough, but also, it's because, to an extent, Britain's afraid of the Germans. And not afraid in the terms of they think they're going to destroy them, they think they're capable. It's one of the things, the British image of the German Navy is they are far more capable than the French Navy ever were. To, the, to be honest, this is going to sound strange, the Germans have replaced the Dutch. I've talked about this before with the Battle of Camperdown. The fact is, the Battle of Camperdown at the time was seen as almost a bigger thing than many of the battles fought against the battles fought against the French. Pretty much any battle other than the, the Battle of Trafalgar, Battle of Camperdown is up there. These days, we barely remember it because it's the traditional ally. The traditional enemy was the French, fighting the French. But the Battle of Camperdown, that was the big one for the Royal Navy. Why? Because the Dutch were considered the far better navy. Even crippled by all the internal politics and debates going on they uh, as they were, they were still considered far and away better than their French counterparts. And it's the same with the Germans. They are considered a very good navy. So they're considered far higher risk than anyone else they fought. She then returned to Britain and served with the 3rd and later 6th Cruiser Squadrons. In 1907, one of her captains is William Ruck Keen, and he held it till October 1910. In 1911, she's in the Mediterranean under Douglas Gamble. Well, she's a flag cat, she's under the captain Reginald Twitt, but she's Douglas Gamble's flagship. He's a rear admiral. Gamble's flag lieutenant at the time is a general called Bertram Ramsey. I'm not sure where you'll hear of him again, but that's a kind of interesting thing to think about, that the flag, uh, the admiral is Douglas Gamble. He's one of those admirals in the Royal Navy history who often gets forgotten and put to one side. During World War One, he was commander of 4th Battle Squadron and then joins the war staff in the Admiralty in 1915 and retires in 1917. But the fact is, his flag captain was Twitt, 
his flag lieutenant was Bertram Ramsey. Those are not officers you send to someone who is not going to support and promote their career and not going to be good to train them up. So that tells you his quality. It, one of the interesting things I think that comes about in the naval war, especially in the whole scenario that develops with the with the battle cruiser fleet and the grand fleet and all the things going on, is you do get because of the way the war focuses in on North Sea. After a certain amount of time. You don't hear a lot about the other talent and the rest of the talent the Royal Navy has and what they're doing. And Gamble is one of those officers who doesn't really get the commands he would have get, got and would have been expected to get if this was a truly Napoleonic era war or even if it had been World War II. If it had been World War II, I can guarantee you, and Gamble had been similarly placed as he was then, he would have been on a senior posting commanding one of the fleets off around the world. And would have been very good at it. But the trouble is, you only need one Jellico. And whilst you need someone very much to replace BT, you need someone very much to replace BT, there is only one BT. And that's a problem. If you're not replacing Jellico, then that creates a ceiling at which you can't really promote officers up. So they have to go out and they, it, it, it just creates a problem. And the trouble is, Jellico is very good at his job, so you don't want to replace him. But then you don't have these independent commands for these other officers. And she returns home in 1912 and is assigned to the Reserve Third Fleet. At the outbreak of war in August 1914, she's the flagship of the 7th Cruiser Squadron. Now, her combined force is supposed to be destroyers and submarines for the 7th Cruiser Squadron. Basically, that's what Cruiser Force C is supposed to be. They're, it's, they're patrolling the broad 14 North Sea. They've got destroyers. They've got submarines based at Harwich. It's a combined force. Okay, This is the purpose of it. So again, when someone goes, oh, this is a live bait squadron. These ships are out on their own. They're not supposed to be. They're out on their own because of the weather. Not because that's their intention. Now, after her sisters were sunk, she and Eurylus were transferred to the 12th Cruiser Squadron to escort ships between England and Gibraltar in October 1914. And then they were transferred to Egypt in January 1915. But they didn't arrive before February, and this meant they missed the Turkish raid on the Suez Canal. The help us have been for her and Eurylus to actually support the Turkey, uh, support the Suez Canal and prevent it being really attacked seriously. Uh, then they went and took part in various things on terms of the Battle of Gallipoli. And again, Bacante seems to get good officers because she takes part in suppressing Turkish artillery uh, positions at Gapatehe. And she actually, well, how do I put this point? At one point, she's pointing her bow at the beach in order to try and get a posi better position for firing her guns, and she keeps manoeuvring constantly to try and get her guns in the perfect position to fire on the Turkish guns. She then provided fire support for forces near Anzac Cove for the next several months, and particularly took part in the third attack at, out on Anzac Cove on 19th of May. Uh, when she, together with three of the pre-Drenauts, suppressed Turkish artillery to the extent that it pretty much ceased to be a factor as part of the attack. On 28th of May, Bacante and HMS Kennet, a destroyer, destroyed enemy shipping in Badrum Harbour. And then, three months later, she bombarded Turkish troops at the Battle of Lone Pine. You know, and, and the, then the Battle of Chinook Blair. So that's 6th, 7th and 9th of August. She was not present, however, when the Allies began to evacuate Gallipoli in December. But her captain is. Algernon Boyle is ashore commanding the evacuation at Anzac Cove. So the captain's there, not the ship. 
She then remains him in train until late 1916, then she returns home. She has a collision with Achilles, an armoured cruiser, in the Irish Sea in February 1917, and then, after repairs, becomes flagship of the 9th Cruiser Squadron, at, based at Sierra Leone, from April 1917 to November 1918, where she's proved very useful. She's paid off in Chatham in April 1918 and sold it for scrap in July 1920. Euralis. Ah, Euralis. Again. There is a debate as to the particular source of this name. But I'm fairly sure it's one of the variations on Apollo, considering the Royal Navy. The other options are, of course, the Sousa of Hippodemia. Um, oh, good lord. Was son of Nabulus, one of the Phoenicians who encountered by Odysseus during the Odyssey. There are all sorts of options, but I'm fairly sure it's the surname of Apollo, which is the source of this one for the Royal Navy, because that's suitably godly. Anyway, leaving that to one side, when she was launched on 20th May 1901, she was launched in front of 30,000 spectators and christened by Mrs. Douglas Vickers, wife of one of the directors of the company. Now, unfortunately, on the 11th of June 1901, so... Only a few weeks later, the south side of Ramsden Dock at Barrow catches fire and was pretty much destroyed. And the recently launched the Eurylis, which was lying alongside this wharf, had the teak wood, oh, teak wood of the sheaving set on fire as well. She was very badly damaged before she was hauled from the pier into the middle of the dock and her completion was therefore severely delayed. So this is why she takes so long. She actually had to be towed to Camel Laird at Birkenhead for repairs. While she was there, the ship slipped off the block supporting her in dry dock and was severely damaged. While on sea trials, she collided with an auxiliary vessel, Traveller, on 27th of June 1903 at Devonport. She was finally therefore completed 5th of January 1904 two years after her sister ships. The ship is therefore a product of Vickers, Camel Airs, and a lot of Royal Navy Devonport work to try and get her ready. Upon commissioning, she became flagship of the Australia Station. Now there she served for three years, returning home in 1905. She was reduced to reserve upon her arrival, and then she was sent to the North American West Indies Station in 1906, where she served as the boys' training ship attached to the 4th Cruiser Squadron for the next three years. It's, it's amazing. I, I didn't see that coming at all. She was then assigned to... The reserve fur fleet when she returned home in 1909, and in August 1914 she is assigned the Seventh Cruiser Squadron. On the 10th of August, she became the flagship of Rear Admiral Arthur Christian, commander of the Southern Force, formed to command all the forces defending the east end of the Channel. During the Battle of Heligan Blight on 20th of August, she was held in reserve for the Dutch coast and saw no action. On the 20th of September 1914, Eurylis and her sisters Abaker, Kersey and Ho were on patrol on the Broad 14. Eurylis had to return to port that morning to recall. Two days later, sadly enough, the three remaining cruisers were sunk. We'll be talking about that in a bit. Rear Admiral Arthur Christian was subsequently relieved of his command. Because that suddenly makes it all right, because he was, of course, completely at fault. She and, Bac uh, she and her sister Bacante were transferred to the 12th Cruiser Squadron. And, as said, 
she then has a career where she pretty much goes everywhere with Bakande. However, Eurylis became the flagship of Rerum and Rosslyn Wemyss in April in uh, 1915 after he was put in charge of the main landings at Gallipoli. During landings at Cape Hells on the morning of 25th of April, Eurylis transported three companies of the 1st Battalion of Lancashire Fusiliers and a platoon of the Royal Naval Division and then provided fire support to the landing after soldiers were transferred to their boats for the actual landing on Beach W. She bombarded Turkish positions during the Second Battle of Kharifa on 6th of May. And it was May when Moemus hauled down his flag and resumed his original commanding allied base at Mudros. Eurylis then receives a brief refit at Malta from the 30th of December 1915 to the 20th of January 1916 before proceeding to Egypt to reinforce the defences there. In January 1916, Weymouth, now the new commander-in-chief East Indies, again hoisted his flag aboard Eurylis. He likes this ship. And from January 1917 through to 24th of April, she's refitted at Bombay. In 29th of June, she bombarded the barracks at Yemeni towns of Hodleida, uh, together with the troop ship Rim Northbrook and the Royal, well, the Royal Indian Marine Northbrook, and Rear Admiral Ernest Gannett relieved Yem Wemis as Commander in Chief in July 1917, transferring his flag to, Nor uh, to Northbrook on 20th of August. In early November, Eurylis dismounted four 6 inch and four 12 pounder guns at Bombay before proceeding to Hong Kong. She is paid off there in December and is converted to a mine layer. This sadly day was not finished before the war was ended, and so she returned to Britain to be laid up at the Nore in April 1919. She sold for scrap in July 1920, and in irony of ironies, she's actually broken up in Germany beginning in September 1922. And that's Euros. They're good ships. This one was a bit of a calamity ship, and let's be honest, how many more ships does the Royal Navy really need named after Apollo? Alright. The action of the 22nd of September. As I mentioned, Force. The Solar Force is under Rear Admiral Arthur Christian, is composed of Eurylis' flagship, Light Cruiser Amethyst. The 7th Cruiser Squadron, also known as Cruiser Squadron C, under Rear Admiral H. Campbell, nicknamed, of course, Live Bait Squadron, um, comprising of Bacante, Abaca, Hogue, Cressy, and, of course, Eurylis, which was Christian's flagship. The 1st and 3rd Destroyer Flotillas, 10 submarines of the 8th Overseas Flotilla, and the Active Class Scout Cruiser, HMS Fearless. So that is the whole force he has to patrol. He has two destroyer flotillas. He has ten submarines. He has a light cruiser, Amethyst, and which is... I what type of light cruiser she is? Mm, she's a Topaz class, yes. Third class protected cruiser, Topaz, a light cruiser. And HMS Fearless. And that is the force he has out there. Now. The war orders of 20th July 1914, which reflected various assumptions, were still in force in September 1914. The ships were ordered to patrol the area south of the 54th parallel, clear of enemy torpedo craft and destroyers, supported by Cruiser Force C during the day. The Harwich Patrol guarded the Dogger Bank and the Broad 14s further south. The cruisers were to the north, closer to Dogger Bank, and sailed south at night. The cruisers were moved to the Broad 14s to reinforce the 4th four cruiser uh, during troop movements from Britain to France. Heading south, Put the ships, of course, close to the German bases, which made a more vulnerable submarine attack. Now, here is where you get the problem. 
there is a lot of micromanaging going on from the Admiralty at the beginning of World War One. It is obscene. It leads to Coronel, it leads to all sorts of things. And it leads to this. On the 16th of September, on the 16th of September, Christian was allowed to keep two cruisers from north and one at the Broad 14s, but had to keep them together in a central position, able to support operations in both areas. Next day, 17th of September, the destroyers are forced to depart by heavy weather. And they, the weather remained so bad that neither patrol could be reformed. The Admiralty therefore orders the ships to cancel the Dogger Bank patrol and cover just the broad 14s until the weather abated. Now this is of course positioned to the North Sea. On the 20th of September, Uralus has to return to port to recall. And this leaves Abakur, Hogue and Crazy under the command of Captain J.E. Drummond of Abakur. Please note that. So, Christian has followed orders. He's done what he's been told. He's remonstrated where he's needed to, but he's done what he's been told. And now he's had to return home. So he's no he's positioned his forces as allowed by the Admiralty. And he's not there. He's had to go home to get more fuel for his ship. And he's left a senior captain in charge. Okay. Please note this. In the first six weeks of the war, the U-boat arm of the German Navy had sent out just ten boats. Ten boats. And they'd sunk no ships and they'd lost two of their boats. So, so far, some Marines were looking at zero kills for the loss of two. At this point, let's think this through honestly. Given that level of information, the Germans have been sending some Marines, send out ten submarines. They've lost two boats. They've not sunk a single enemy ship. How high would the submarine threat be in your mind at this point? It's probably there, but is it going to be something you are going to be obsessing about? It should be, but to an extent, am I saying that because of my knowledge of what comes next? At 0600 hours, on the 22nd of September, the weather had calmed, and the ships were patrolling at a speed of 10 knots in line abreast roughly two nautical miles apart. They had lookouts posted, hunting for submarine periscopes or ships, and one gun on each side of each ship was crewed. Now, U-9, the submarine, under Captain Lieutenant Otto Wedergun, had been sent out to attack British transports at Ostend, but had herself been forced to dive in shelter from the storm. Again, remember, some Marines spend most of their time on their surface at this point. They only dive when they need to for their own protection. When he surfaced, Wedergan spotted these three ships and moved to attack. At 0620 hours, U-9 fired a torpedo at the middle ship. This was from a range of 550 yards roughly half a kilometre, striking Abakur on the starboard side, flooding the engine room and causing the ship to stop immediately. No submarines have been sighted at this point, so Drummond assumes that the ship had hit a mine. Not a faulty assumption if you consider the information he has available. He orders the other two cruisers to close in to help. That is a bit of a faulty assumption, because if it's hit a mine, there could be other mines there. Why are you heading that direction? Abaker capsized after 25 minutes and sank five minutes later. Only one lifeboat could be launched because of damage from the explosion and the failure of the steam-powered winches which were needed to launch the others. After firing the torpedo, U-9 had dived. At this point, she rises to periscope death and Wedigan saw the other two cruisers rescuing men from Abaker. At this point, and this is fairly early in the war, remember, Wedergan fires two torpedoes at the Hogue. This is from 300 yards away. This is very, very close. As the torpedoes were fired, the bow 
of U-9 rose out of the water and she's spotted by Hogue. The gunners opened fire before the submarine dived. Unfortunately, the two torpedoes were, were fired at 300 yards. They struck, and within five minutes, Captain Wil uh, Wilmot Nicholson gave the order to abandon ship. Hogue, capsi uh, Hogue capsized after 10 minutes and sank at 0715 hours. Cressy had also, the crew that watched on Cressy had also seen the submarine. They had opened fire and made an abortive attempt to ram before turning to pick up survivors. At 0720 hours, U-9 fired two torpedoes at Cressy from her stern torpedo tubes. This was at a range of a thousand yards. This is the longest range shot of the entire thing. One torpedo miss and the submarine turned to fire a remaining bow torpedo at a distance of 550 yards. So one of the first pair of torpedoes strikes Cressy on the starboard side at around 0725 hours. And the second torpedo hits the port beam at 0730 hours. The ship capsizes to starboard and floats upside down until 0755 hours. Dutch sailing trawlers within the vicinity declined to close with Crecy for fear of mines, and distress crawls had been received by Twitt, who was with a destroyer squadron and was already at sea returning to cruisers to be part of their protection force and part of the combined force now the weather removed, but hadn't got there at time. At 0830 hours, the Dutch steamship Flora bravely, very, very bravely, approaches the scene and rescues 286 crew in the water. Another steamer, the Titan, picked up 147. More were rescued by lower soft sailing trawlers, Correda and JGC, before the destroyers arrived at 1045. 837 were, uh, men were rescued. But, 62 officers, 1,397 men, were killed. The dead include Robert Johnson, the captain of Crazy. Destroyers, of course, hunted the submarine, which... Well, let's put it this way. Uh, which was little electrical power remaining to travel underwater, and could only make 40 knots on the surface, so they presumed it couldn't get far, but it, what it did was it submerged for night and returned to base the next day. And the thing is, they didn't have jet charges, they didn't have Aztec. None of those things which you would have in World War II. So, do these ships deserve the record of being terrible because of what happens to them? No. Because in 1897, we go back to White's right up here. Is there any mention of dealing with submarines? No, because that's not even on the idea front at that point. Destroyers, maybe, not submarines. Well, not even destroyers, really. Torpedo boats, but torpedo boats are getting bigger and turning into torpedo boat destroyers at this point. I'm not... Honestly, I... I this is one of those things. What would have been the sensible decision? You could argue the Admiralty should have said, right then, if you can't be there with your destroyers, if your destroyers can't stay there, you should come back. That would be the sensible decision. That would certainly be the decision made later in the war. But this was in the early days of the war. The submarine was a new weapon. They didn't understand it. So they made the decisions that were made were made. I think the problem I have with it comes when you start holding people like Rear Admiral Christian at fault of it and you're going, Yeah, he mucked up. He made. No, he didn't. He was following orders. He was exercising for. And again, no one had dealt with this threat. The Admiralty in 1914 is many things in terms of ships. It's got some wonderful new ships coming online, cable, and very viable vessels. But it's also got a lot of ships which, frankly, they've survived, but they've survived because they need the numbers. And it's got ships which... It's got, well, it's got ships which, frankly, shouldn't be in the places they're in. And that's these ships. Where would I have them, though? Well, that's the question is, where would I want them? 
Honestly, the problem for the Royal Navy is that building battle cruisers gives you a lot of good looking ships and they sound so great. And giving you building light cruisers gives you theoretically your numbers, and that's your high low mix there. But as I've said before on various videos, the high low mix is a lie. It's a cool lie, but it's a lie because what you need is you need the high. And you need the medium, which is the low in your high fret scenarios. And you need the medium and the low, which is the high low in your lower medium, low to medium fret scenarios. And these ships needed to be medium. And the thing is, the British weren't building the medium ships. They were built, churning out town class cruisers. Woohoo, lovely. They were churning out dreadnoughts and they were churning out Battle cruisers, all oh, lovely. Got the high, got the low. Where does the thing in the middle? And you need that thing in the middle. Otherwise, you end up with this scenario. Again, though, with two torpedoes being fired at that closer range, is there any real defense you could have had that could have survived it? Short of Nelson and Rodney and the stuff they had when they were built, or the stuff that was planned for the G3s. I'm not sure. I honestly don't know. But some more subdivision, some better internal protection for some, from to, uh, internal bulges to deal with the torpedo, impact of torpedoes. Yeah, i give them a bit of a chance. But really, what they needed was their escorting destroyers. So we've got coming up. Well, we have the Arafusa class tomorrow. And next week, we have the last of the Naval History uh, the cru Year of the Cruisers cruiser series, or our Christmas special videos. Which is going to be the Admiral Hibbert class. And here's the question. Because I have been discussing where else would they have been better. Well, would a Crecy have helped at the Battle of Coronel? No! And I've already said why. Because their guns are too low. If you want to fight in those sort of waters. These are the sort of ships you need. Duke of Edinburgh. Warrior or Minotaurs. And remember, HMS Defense is what he has been promised. It's what Craddock's been promised is coming. If Craddock had had HMS Defense, the Battle of Coronel would go very, very differently. You replace he probably at that point would have sent Otranto home. Because he wouldn't he wouldn't be worried about having the lack of numbers. Because defense with its seven and a half inch guns and four nine point two inch guns would be a case of Hello! Um, please, be, um, be a friend, be kind, save ammunition, form line abreast, and I will deal with you all individually or at the same time. But these are the ships you need. The Cressies are too slow. Their top speed is 21 knots, and as you saw earlier mentioned, their practical top speed is 19 and 3 quarters knots. There is a difference. The fact is, these ships, any of these, any of the ten vessels which comprise these three classes would have been what you need. A battle cruiser would be even better, but any of these would have made a big difference at Coronel. Not a Cressy. Cressy is a 19th century. These are the 20th century. And it's these which, if if we're being sense if the Royal Navy had been being sensible and had ordered Six, six, and six of all these. The odds are, I'm doubtful the Cressies would have still been in the service. The Diadam's Cressies, I think a lot of those vessels have been gone. You'd have had eight more of these ships in the service. And if you'd been really sensible, you'd have ordered batches of eight of each of these. Or you'd have ordered six, 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 and you'd have kept ordering, you'd order another six after them, another six after that. You'd have kept ordering these to fill that middle roll. The high middle, uh, high mid low. The high low mix. You need that middle ship, and these are the middle. Right. So, I'm looking forward to Thursday's live. It's going to be fun. I've got a good one lined up for you. It's all going to be about Nelson and Rodney and the design structure and why it winds people up and why it causes issues. But the question is going to be based off this. 
I would like you. I know you're. I always love it when the viewers ask me what if questions. I find them interesting and intriguing. Well, here is my what if for you. I want you to look at these three classes, the Juku Enabra, the Warrior, and the Minosaur class. And I want you to think, hang on, the world is continuing. In the post dreadnought era, in all this stuff, while they're carrying on, they decide, after they've built the Minosaur class, hmm, actually we do need some of these ships to replace some of our older ships, so we're going to keep a low rate production of this type of ship going. What do they build? I'd, I'd like to see what you think the equivalent of these being built at the same time as Queen Elizabeth, etc. would be. What their classes they would have matched up with. Because I think they'd have been ordering a batch each year. Three or four. I wish they'd been ordering six to eight, but it'll be probably three to four. And I'd like to hear what you think of them. Of course, famously for the um, Minotaurs, their fourth one, Orion, is cancelled and the name's used for a battleship. But, you know, it'd be nice to hear. I'd, I'd like to see what you think of them. And finally, as we're at the end of this, and I want to make one point, last point, one last plea. As you'll know from watching many other videos, hopefully, if you have... There is a f the annual family bets are going on, and the annual Christmas related one between my mum and my mum's twin sister is on. If I can get to 10,000 subscribers by Christmas Day, that is zero zero hundred hours on the 24th, uh, you know, Christmas Eve to Christmas Day, that point, that's when it's recounted by, then my aunt gives my mum some fancy bath stuff and my mum gets to pick the topic of the next, de next bet and if not my mum has to bake my aunt a cake I think it, and a few things so please I'm asking this nicely if you like the videos please like please share please subscribe mainly from perspective not for me although it does help me on the channel and does help me get spread out the love of naval history wider and further to people which I always enjoy but mainly so that my mum can win the bet, and, <laughs> oh, good lord, I'm a 35-year-old male asking for this, but let, please, you all understand it, okay? It's, it, it's family. No matter how old we get, it's family. And, yeah. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. It wouldn't be possible without you, and take care. Hope you enjoyed, and hope you found the crazy class interesting. And once again... Dedicated to Michael Coleman, who was one of the coolest IT teachers I think I have ever had the pleasure of knowing. And it's rather appropriate considering how he how good he could do the Grumpy Man act that his um his celebration of life, as they put it, took place at the Grumpy Mole. Thank you very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Take care. And Arafusa class of 1913 tomorrow.